Hi guys, it's Anthony from Immortal Games. Today's video is going to be about the Two Headed Giant event that I went to a pre-release for. Now the pre-release gave you two pre-release kits, uh, one having six packs, the other having the same. You both get uh, two promos. One is a legendary, um, it could be a saga, uh, it could be a creature, equipment, uh, legendary sorcery, any legendary from the set from any rarity, so it would be uncommon, mythic, or rare. Uh, you also received one promo of any rare in the set, so legendary or not. Um, and that was your stamped promo with the date on it. Now you had to create two 40-card decks. Uh, you played simultaneously. You shared a life total of 30, took turns at the same time if you're unfamiliar with Two-Headed Giant, and you just tried to beat your opponents. Now they did the games as best of one, so if you made any mistakes or you got mana screwed or land flooded, well, you just had to ride that ship out and take the loss. So the event went okay. We ended up going two and three and leaving. Um, we did really well until we started only drawing lands, and that's what happened. So sometimes you lose the magic. But I'm going to go over the decks that we played, uh, how they performed, what they were good against, what they weren't good against. Um, I'm also going to go over the extra rares and uncommons that we pulled that we didn't play. So I'm going to start off with the cards that we didn't play, and we'll go on from there. Okay, so we're going to start with the rares and uncommons that we didn't use. So clearly this was one of the rare promos. It has the date stamped in the gold ink. Um, it's the Tempest Gin, which is subpar, but it's okay. Three blue, zero four, flying Tempest Gin gets plus one, plus zero for each basic island you control. Now, we didn't play him because he's very heavy on the blue mana. Um, you would have to play either a two color, very heavy in blue, or mono blue in order to manage playing this card effectively, so we opted out of using him. The other one we pulled was Mirari Conjecture. It's four in a blue. It's an enchantment saga. Return target instant card from your graveyard to your hand. You do the same thing with a sorcery the next turn, and at the end, until end of turn, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you copy it. Uh, you may choose new targets for the copy. Now, you'd have to play a very spell-heavy deck to get a lot of use out of this. However, there are some instants and sorcery you might want to recur with this. Uh, we just didn't play it because it ended up costing 5, and your value doesn't come until turn 8. And we were trying to go a little faster than that. So we also pulled Kazarov Sangir Pureblood. He's 5 and 2 black. 4-4 four, four Vampire. He's got Flying. Whenever a creature an opponent controls is dealt damage, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Kazarov Sangir Pureblood. Uh, you pay 3 to red, and he deals 2 damage to target creature. Now, he's a pretty decent bomb, um, but the reason we didn't play him is because we didn't go too heavy into black, and he just costs 7 to get out for a 4-4 four, four flyer. There are stronger flyers at lower mana costs that you'd have to worry about, and then if you had to wait a turn to use his deal 2 damage ability, he still only becomes a 5-5. Five, five. So, I mean, in a long game, he's very powerful, um, but you don't want too many top-end creatures, so we didn't end up playing him. We probably could have, though. Uh, he probably wouldn't have done too bad. Now, we also pulled Lich's Mastery, which is 3 and 3 black. It's a legendary enchantment, and it had us Hexproof. You can't lose the game. Whenever you gain life, you draw that many cards. But whenever you lose life for each one life you lost, you exile a permanent you control or a card from your hand or graveyard. And when Lich's Mastery leaves the battlefield, you lose the game. Now, we thought about playing this just for the jokes, but the issue is... If we were to take a hit for, say, five or six, it's not that we would lose one card, we would lose five or six cards. Which, in a game where you don't always have a creature, and you can't always protect yourself even though your teammate can protect you, it just leaves you out in the open. If you were to lose your lands, lose your hand, it puts you way too far behind, and there's no way to really return from that in a limited format. Now, we have our uncommons that we didn't use. We have... Two copies of board, or three copies of board the weather light. It's one in a white, and you look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a historic card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Now, this is a good dig spell, um, but it takes place of a couple other spells you might need. Maybe some buffs, some creatures themselves, um, but we did not play the copies of this. We also have Sage of Latnam. He's one in a blue. You tap him, sacrifice an artifact, and draw a card. Now, it's a good draw engine if you've got enough artifacts to get rid of. Uh, we, however, did not really have any artifact synergy. 
We have Tetsuko Umazawa Fugitive, one in a blue. Creatures you control with power, toughness, one or less can't be blocked. He's a 1-3. Now in the first make of a deck, we uh, made a red-blue kind of control deck. Um, well, red-blue-white. And we did play the Tetsuko. He did all right, but we did switch off of that build when we lost our first match. And it didn't... You know, it definitely improved. So I'll go over the deck we turned it into later. Um, but he's definitely good. And he just didn't find a place in the remade deck. So we also got Urza's Tome. It costs two colorless. You can pay three and tap it. You draw a card, then discard a card, unless you exile a historic card from your graveyard. Now we thought about playing this in the creature base deck for card draw to just get rid of cards in the graveyard. They weren't coming back anyways. Um, but... We couldn't find a slot for it without removing a creature, and we didn't really want to lower our uh, chances that way. We also pulled Jorah's Familiar. I believe we have, I guess it's one of these. It's four colors for a 2-2 flyer, and historic spells you cast cost one less to cast. Now, in a limited format, this isn't bad. You can play it at any color, and it makes your legendary creatures cost less. And when you're opening one legendary creature per pack, possibly two, um, it's really good. It makes your sagas cost less, your artifacts cost less. Um, once again, though, we just couldn't find the slot for it. It would have fit really well in the creature deck if we had more historic spells in there. Now, we have two copies of Howling Golem, and the reason we didn't play this for card draw, it's a uh, three cost, two, three, not too bad on the stats for limited, but whenever it attacks or blocks, each player draws a card. Now, letting two opponents draw two cards on you when you're ahead lets them catch up, and when you're behind, you're just putting them farther ahead. So we decided it was not a good idea to play these. You have the Amaranthine Wall. Costs 4, it's a 0 6 defender. It's good for just holding out. Um, and you can pay 2 and give it indestructible until end of turn. Um, we didn't really want a wall strategy, so we didn't play that. But if you were trying to kind of build up and mill your opponent out, if you got a lot of good blue mill cards, this would be a great way to stop them from hitting you. We pulled the Fire Fist Adept, 4 and a red for a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever he enters the battlefield, does X damage to target creature and opponent controls, where X is the number of wizards you control. Uh, we were playing him in the red-blue deck we made. However, we only had, like, three wizards, so we didn't get really any value out of him, um, because he would come in and then do one damage. So, 5 for a 3-3 three, three that comes in and deals one is not too great. We had the Orcish Vandal. He's 1 and 1 red for a 1 1, and you sacrifice an artifact and he deals 2 damage to any target. Uh, Would have been great if we pulled a bunch of artifacts. Uh, we did not pull a bunch of artifacts, so. Skizik, 3 and a red for a 5 3. He's got a kicker of 1 red. He's got trample and haste. In the beginning of the end step, if Skizik wasn't kicked, you sacrifice it. Uh, he was also in the red blue white deck. Um, like I said, we got rid of that deck when it didn't really work out the way we planned. We got Valduk, Keeper of Flame. He's 2 and a red for a 3-2. And in the beginning of combat on your turn, for each R and equipment attached to Valduk, Keeper of Flame, create a 3-1 red elemental creature token with Trample and Haste. And you exile those tokens at the beginning of the next end step. Now, he would have been very strong, seeing as we pulled two really good equipments for limited. Um, and even just the two equipments would have given us two 3-1s combined with Tetsuko, makes those 3-1s unblockable. The only thing was is we never drew him. So I believe we pulled a second one of him. I'm not sure where it went, but uh, we never pulled him. So he was in there and just didn't see play. We have Fight with Fire. It's two and a red. It's got a kicker of six, five and a red, and it deals five damage to target creature. If this spell was kicked, it deals ten damage divided as you choose among any number of targets instead. So hitting somebody straight to the face for ten damage is really powerful. Um, but you got to be able to pay the cost, which is 9. And I didn't see anybody kick this spell. Now, I kicked a spell for 10 in the deck that we'll go over later. Um, but it only happened once, and that was once we went to time and rounds. So, doing that in time and rounds, yeah, you win the game. But more than likely, you're going to play this and just kill something that has 5 health. Oh, there's other Valduk. We also opened Raph Caption, Ship's Mage. He was in the blue-red-white deck as well. He's a Flash Flying, 3-3, three, three, and you may cast his Sork spells as though they had Flash. Um, there's a really important card that I'll show you later that this came in handy for. This was my pack promo. It is Garn of the Blood Flame. Um, three, a black and a red. It's a 3-3 three, three with Flash, and when Garn of the Blood Flame enters the battlefield, you return your hand 
all creature cards in your grave uh, return to your hand all creature cards in your graveyard that were put from anywhere this turn and other creatures you control with haste um we tried to see if we could get black red to work and our black permanents as far as the commons and uncommons went were just not strong enough here's one of our uh, wizards we had Adelie's a cinder win it is one one blue and one red it's a 2-2 two, two with flying and haste, and whenever you cast an instance of sorcery spell, wizards you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. If we pulled enough uh, instants and sorceries, we could have made this work, but we played her for the 2-2 two, two flying and haste more than anything else. Here's our black uncommons. As you see, we only pulled two. We got the lingering phantom. It's five and a black. It's a 5-4. Whenever you cast a historic spell, you can pay a black if you do return lingering phantom from your graveyard to your hand. Now, seeing as you could only record this maybe once or twice and it doesn't have flying, we decided it wasn't really good enough. And then Thalid Soothsayer, which is three and a black. You pay two, sacrifice a creature, draw a card. For a 2-3, for four, that makes you lose board presence when you're not playing a fungus or a sapperling deck. It uh, really wasn't going to work with the strategy we went with. So what we'll do here is I'll give you a basic rundown of what each deck was. And then I will start with one and then move on to the other. So we had our main bulk here is the green-white creature deck. Um, it banked off of a really heavy-hitting, low-cost creatures in order to kind of pump us up and go. And the other one is a bug or a blue, uh, black, and green deck that banked off of Moldratha um, to play cards and recur them out of your graveyard. And it was more of a controly mid-range style deck with a few creatures and um, more ways to shut your opponent down. So we're going to go with the main offense to start with. The first thing I'm going to go through with this one, since it is creature-centric, is the creatures itself. So we played Dauntless Bodyguard. He was one white for a 2-1. And as he enters the battlefield, you choose another creature you control. You sacrifice him, and the chosen creature gains indestructible until the end of turn. Uh, seeing him on turn one is super strong. Um, we only saw that happen one time. But seeing him late game was really good as far as protecting our creatures. We pulled a Landmore Elf. Of course, you know, being able to ramp into your three and four drop creatures is very good. Uh, once again, only saw play on turn one once. After that, usually turn three or four is when we saw it, but it still came in handy for those kicker costs. We got a Knight of Grace, one and a white. Uh, first strike, hexproof from black, and Knight of Grace gets plus one plus zero as long as any player controls a black permanent. So it's a two two that can become a three two with first strike. Can't be touched by black spells, which was really important because there was a lot of black removal being played. Now, red removal went right through, but that's okay uh, because this basically fought and won against any low-cost creature. Um, it did a lot of work for us, and it really made its, uh, made its weight worth it. We got Untamed Kavu. One and a green. It's a 2-2. Two -two. It's Kicker's 3. Now, it has Vigilance and Trample at all points in time. So if anything, a 2-2 two -two for vig with uh, Vigilance and Trample, I mean, that's two keywords on a two-cost creature with the same power and toughness. That's really good. Um, but you get a 5-5 five -five with Vigilance and Trample if you kick it. So we definitely wanted to play this. However, once again, we did not draw it across five games. We didn't see the card once. We got Elfheim Druid. Now it's one and a green. It's a zero two. You can add a green if you tap it, or you can tap it, add two green, and kick a spell. Now this came in handy for kicking other spells, um, but it also just, you know, mana ramped us up. This was a huge player. Now, Shauna Cisse's Legacy for one green and one white is a legendary creature, human warrior. Now she's a zero zero, but she can't be targeted of abilities your opponents control, so not quite hexproof, but she couldn't be shut down by tap abilities or pay abilities. And she gets plus one plus one for each creature you control. Now, when you're playing a creature deck and you're going wide, being able to create a giant two drop is uh, really just potent. It's very strong. And we actually pulled two of her. So this was the other promo that we had, was another Shauna Cisse's Legacy. Um, she was just so valuable. So being able to play two of her really caught people off guard. Uh, we also got Invoke the Divine, two and a white, destroy target artifact or enchantment, you gain four life. Originally we weren't playing cards like these. We have one of these and one that deals with flyers. Um, and the reason we have it set up that way was because we only got one, it was best of one game. So we needed ways to deal with those fringe cards, like especially the amount of sagas being played, to deal with things like ice over and 
even things to just exile your creature. Because once you get those on the battlefield, you don't have a second chance to sideboard cards in and deal with those. So I was a little out of place. We were going to do the support cards later, but that's all right. Uh, continuing with the creatures, we have Marwyn the Nurturer. It's a two and a green for a 1-1. One, one. Whenever another elf enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Marwyn the Nurturer. You can tap and add an amount of uh, green equal to Marwyn's power. Now, we didn't really end up using Marwyn to ramp too much, as much as just as a 2-2 two, two, or a 3-3 three, three, um, later on in the game. But being able to tap it for three green when you really need it was pretty good. Uh, we really just put it in there to help us get those kickers off as well. Now we have Sergeant at Arms. It's two and a white. For a 2-3, a kicker of two and a white, so you could pay six if you wanted to. And when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, you create uh, two 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens. So this, combined with uh, Shauna Cissé's Legacy, was really powerful. Um, a lot of times, because we pulled multiples of these, um, a lot of times we would play one for three, and then we would play the second one for six. Um, that way we got some board presence out on turn three, but then still had a wide board strategy set up for later turns. Uh, we originally were playing three of him, and we removed one copy to bring in that enchantment spell because uh, we had some higher-end creatures that we didn't want to get rid of. So we got Baloth Gorger. We were originally playing two of him, um, and we cut it down to just one to play another removal spell, which was the Flying Killer. It does seven damage to target creature with flying. We'll get to that later as well. But we have two. Two green is a 4-4, four, four, and it has a kicker of four, so you could pay eight. And it enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. So you could play eight for a 7-7. Seven, seven. Um, just a big green creature. So We played Call of the Cavalry. Three and a white. Create two, two, two white knight creature tokens with vigilance. Once again, just trying to go wide for Cissé. We got Quinde, Pride of Fimereth. He's a three and a white with double strike, and creatures you control with first strike have double strike. So he was really just in here to play off of the knight. Um, I don't think there were any other first strike creatures that we could play off with him, but just giving that knight double strike was enough. Oh, there's the second Baloth Gorger. A little mixed up. We also got a Territorial Allosaurus. It's two green and two for a 5-5. Five five. So we're paying four for a 5-5. Five five. You could pay eight and have it come in and fight something. Um, we never did that because playing this on turn four just puts you so far ahead. We got Grun the Lonely King here. He's four and two green. He's a 5-5 five five with a kicker of three. Uh, when he was kicked, though, you get five plus one plus one counters on him, so he becomes a 10-10. Ten ten. And if he attacks alone, uh, you double his power and toughness, so he essentially can swing for 20, which we had ways of giving trample, so this made him very powerful. We also played Song of Freilies. This was so strong. One and a green. Until your next turn, creature control will gain tap, add one of mana of any color to your mana pool. Now you do this two turns in a row, and then this is where the real punch came in. You put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Those creatures gain vigilance, trample, and indestructible until end of turn. So whether your creatures were going to get through or not, you swung with everything. Because they weren't going to die, and they weren't really tapping, so you could just protect yourself afterwards. Um, usually you took a large chunk out of your opponent's health with this, or took a large bit of their board away. Here's our equipments. We have four bears blade. It was three to play it, three to equip it. Equip creature gets plus three, plus zero, oh, vigilance and trample. Uh, and whenever equip creature dies, you attach four bears blade to target creature you control. Now this is what I was talking about for Grun the Lonely King. Um, you put this on him. He doesn't tap anymore. He swings by himself as a 20-20, or a 26-26 with trample. That's pretty powerful. Um, we only got to swing like that once with him, but just having the possibility was very good. We usually ended up putting this on uh, Shauna, so he says like a C. The other equipment we pulled was the Black Blade Reforged. It costs two. The equip was three to a legendary creature, seven to a non-legendary creature. An equipped creature gets plus one, plus one for each land you control. Um, a lot of times we were doubling up on this or just equipping it late game to a non-legendary creature just to get the massive boost. If you can pay seven to equip it to a creature, you're essentially giving that creature plus seven, plus seven um, in the least. So think about it that way. We have Sylvan Awakening. This did a lot of work as well. It's a two and one green. It's a sorcery until end of your next turn, which was the important key text there, your next turn, not the end of this turn. All lands you control become 2-2 two, two elemental creature tokens with reach, indestructible, and haste. They're still lands. So we would tap Marwyn for three, and then 
all of our lands, which sometimes would be eight or nine lands, became two two elemental creatures with reach and indestructible and haste. Swing with half of them, save half of them to block flyers that might kill you next turn. Um, do whatever you need to do, but putting this much pressure on the board later was very good. And the buff to Cisse on turn, even just turning them into lands to buff your Cisse to swing when they don't have a blocker was worth it. We got Sapperling Migrations. Two, one, and a green. A kicker for four. You create two one one green sapperling creature tokens, and if it was kicked, you create four of those tokens instead. So we really put this in there to once again buff the Shauna, and then we put the Forebearer's Blade on here to be able to plus three, plus zero, oh, Vigilance, and Trample, and we bounce that sword all the way across those one one tokens, so that was pretty annoying for our opponents. We played Gift of Growth. As a one of, we had a couple of these, but it's one and a green. You can kick it for two and then tap target creature. If it gets... Uh, <clears throat> So you t uh, target the creature, it untaps it. It gets plus two, plus two until in a turn. If the spell was kicked, it gets plus four, plus four until in a turn. So we could use this to defend when they didn't expect us to have any blockers. Um, or we could just buff something for four or two, take out one of their larger creatures, or just deal some extra damage. Here's that flying spell I was talking about. It's one and a green for an instant. And Pierce the Sky deals 7 damage to target creature with flying. This dealt with those pesky flyers. There was nothing larger than a 7-7 with flying, so this immediately dealt with it. Then onto the lands. We played a total of, I believe, 17 lands. We played 1, 2, 3, 8 force and 8 planes. So we actually cut a land, I believe, to fit an extra creature because we didn't want to take too many out. And having three mana ramp sources, um, it worked out just fine, and we still ended up flooding out. So that was our aggressive deck. We lost the first match, won the next two in a row, and then ended up losing out on the two after that. Um, we tried to hold on, but we just started having really bad luck as far as drawing concerned in the end. Now this is that other deck, which was that uh, mid-range deck, banking off Muldroth and recurring things from your graveyard. Um, now this Navigator's Compass was only in here for exactly one reason, and that was mana fixing in a three-color deck. Now essentially this could be considered a four-color deck, and I will show you why as we go through here. Um, it's a little kitschy, but it was well worth it. So we got the Navigator's Compass for one, and when it enters the battlefield, you pick up three life, and you can tap it until end of turn. Target land you control becomes the basic land type of your choice in addition to its other types. So you can turn your swamp into an island or a forest, and it basically just changes the colors around so you can um, tap for any mana you need. And we're starting with the spells and the support on this one in the beginning because it was more of a control deck. Now I have Demonic Vigor in here for one black. Enchant Creature. Enchant Creature gets plus one, plus one. And when an Enchanted Creature dies, you return that card to its owner's hand. Uh, this was in here for insurance on Muldrotha as well as putting it on my partner's creatures to make sure that he wasn't losing things like Shauna or important things like a kicked Bayloth or Grun. Um, we had Divest, which is target player reveals their hand for one black, and you choose an artifact or creature card from it, and that player discards that card. Really good to get uh, pesky creatures you didn't want to deal with, as well as large artifacts um, out of their hand. Most of the time, though, you were taking out legendary creatures you didn't want to um, deal with any other way. We got one copy of Syncopate in here. It's one blue and X. Uh, counter target spell unless its controller plays X. If that spell is countered this way, you exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. Happy to see this card return to standard. Um, however, it worked really well in limited because I could pay just about any cost. People were tapping out left and right to play things, and this was always a good bet. We have Gaia's Blessing. Uh, one in a green. Target player shuffles up to three target cards from their graveyard into their library and you draw a card. So I would play it, and I could make my teammate shuffle three cards back in, I could shuffle three cards back in, I'd never target my opponent with this, um, and then I would draw a card. And when Guy's Blessing is put into your graveyard from the library, you shuffle your graveyard into your library. So this was also insurance against mill, because there were people milling you out. If uh, they were playing blue, it was very likely they had the four-drop mill crab creature in here. So this was to save myself from Maldratha loss, and really just to get as much as I could. Now we have Deep Freeze. This caused my opponents so much heartache. It was two and a blue. Enchant creature, it's an aura. Enchant creature has base, power, and toughness zero and four, and has defender, loses all other abilities, and is a blue wall in addition to its other colors and types. So you take their strongest creature, and you turn it into a zero four wall that does absolutely nothing. Um, and then eventually you kill that wall when they block with it. But it was a great way to just ensure that their biggest threat became just another obstacle for you. We pulled two of those, so. 
We also got Divination. Two and a blue. It's a sorcery for draw two cards. Um, you know how important it is to draw cards. So that had to go in here. We played Weight of Memory. It's three and two blue. It's draw three cards for five, and target player puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. So you draw three, they mill three. Um, really powerful way to put yourself way ahead of them as far as uh, value goes. I really found this to be very effective. I could see this being played as maybe a one of in actual control decks if people didn't mind the sorcery cost on it. Now here's what that amulet came in help for. We played one copy of Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, because we pulled him, he's amazing, uh, why wouldn't we play him? He was originally in the red, blue, white deck, um, but the issue came along that that deck just couldn't support him, it couldn't support um, the strength that he had, and so what we did was we made this Moldrotha deck, green, blue, black, put that amulet in there, that's all we needed to see the amulet first, and we could play him out, um, and it happened every time. So we saw the amulet, we played Teferi. He's three, a white, and a blue for a four loyalty planeswalker. You can plus one and draw a card at the beginning of the next end step. You untap two lands. I had enough support instance um, at two or less to justify that, as well as just being able to untap lands was fine. Now, it says untap two lands. It doesn't necessarily untap two of your lands. Um, I didn't dig too deep into that, but I'm not sure if I'd be able to untap my teammate's lands or not. Now, you could minus three and put target non-land permanent permanent into its owner's library, third from the top. So I would do that ability to bury a creature I didn't want to deal with or wasn't able to deal with, and then I would play Weight of Memory and mill that creature out of their deck. So it kind of became removal, but it put him down to one. We never got to emblem him. That would have been amazing. It's minus eight. You get an emblem with whenever you draw a card, you exile target permanent opponent controls. Uh, seeing as I was drawing a decent number of cards, that would have really done a lot of work. So he was an all-star. But we have the Mending of Dominaria. It's three and two green. Worked out a lot um, with the Maldoratha strategy. It was put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So if they milled my Maldoratha or he died, I could always get him back with this. You do that two turns in a row. On the third turn, you return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Then you shuffle your graveyard into your library. So as long as you get your Maldoratha back, by turn three, uh, you have then basically just flooded your field with another three or four lands, and you can play them out of your hand. We've got Rite of Belzenok. As far as limited is concerned, this was very powerful as well. It's two and two black. You create two zero one black cleric creature tokens. You do that two turns in a row, so you end up with four clerics, and then you create a six six black demon creature with flying and trample. At the beginning of your upkeep, you sacrifice another creature. If you can't, this creature deals six damage to you. So you have to sacrifice a creature. You can't choose to take the six damage, but that's why it gives you four clerics. You don't use them to block. Um, you definitely just sack them and keep that six six in the air. So we have Time of Ice. It's three and a blue. Tap target creature and opponent controls. Um, it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as you control Time of Ice. So you could play Time of Ice, tap down two creatures, and on the third turn you return all tap creatures to their owner's hand, whether they were tapped with this or not. They kept your opponents for swinging for a turn as well. Um, and we had funny ways of putting this down, putting it back in my hand, or not putting it back in my hand, but just uh, essentially blinking it back onto the battlefield and resetting that timer and getting two more creatures with it. We've got Lanoir Scout, which is one and a green for a 1-3. You can tap it, and you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Uh, just an extra way for me to get some lands out there for Muldrotha. We got Merfolk Trickster, two blue for a 2-2 two, two flash. When Merfolk Trickster enters the battlefield, you tap target creature and opponent controls. Uh, it loses all abilities until end of turn. So it doesn't matter if it's attacking. You can play this. Uh, the tap clause doesn't come into use, but you make it become just a base creature with no abilities, and you can block it and get it killed. So this was great for killing, like, a Lyra Dawnbringer, um, dealing with a kicked Kavu, things like that really helped out. We've got, uh, I believe, two Academy Drakes. Now, it's a 2-2 for flying, which is mostly what I played it for. Um, and if Academy Drake was kicked, it enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it. Now, since Muldrotha allows you to cast spells from your graveyard, you could play this on turn three, let it die. Once you got your Muldrotha out, you could then kick this back into the battlefield from your graveyard. We have the Homerid Explorer. It's three and a blue for a 3-3. Three, three. And when Homerid Explorer enters the battlefield, target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. You saw this guy getting a lot of play. Um, not so much because he was a 3-3 three, three creature, but that milling four cards was devastating if you hit somebody's main card. 
We also had Josu Vest, the Lich Knight, two and two black. He's a four five with menace. Now his kicker costs six, so his total kick cost would be ten. But when he enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, you create eight two two black zombie knight creature tokens with menace. Now we only pulled that off once, and um, that was a long game. But I kicked him in. They then blocked him and killed him, and then I, with Muldratha, kicked him back out of the graveyard again. So doing silly things like that was very good, and just having a 4-5 with Menace and Limited is hard to deal with. Now we've got Sentinel of the Pearl Trident, this is how we bounce our sagas. He's four colors and one blue, he's a 3-3 three -three with Flash, and when Sentinel of the Pearl Trident enters the battlefield, you may exile target historic permanent you control. If you do, you return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. Um, this assisted us in just making sure that we could keep our sagas going, um, or just flashing in a 3-3 three -three was pretty useful sometimes. We got Tatiova, uh, Benthic Druid, she's three a green, and a blue for a 3-3 three, three Merfolk Druid. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you gain a life and draw a card. It's just simply to try and catch back up when your life is down and just drawing a couple more cards if you're getting land flooded. So she was okay. A lot of times I found other things to play instead of her, um, but she did come into use. We played two Mammoth Spiders for those Pexky Flyers. This is a four- uh, costs or five costs in total four colors and a green. It's a three five with a reach um, Now I would block with this it would die and then I would play it again with Muldaratha And I continued to make sure no flyers got through to us So being able to do that with two and you get up to ten mana. It just kept you Out of reach of your opponent now here we have Muldaratha. I've been talking about in the whole video It's Muldaratha the grave tide. He's three a black a green and a blue so he costs seven for a six six uh, which you step down in stats, but his ability is just so strong. During each of your turns, you may play up to one permanent card of each permanent type from your graveyard. You can play a land, a creature, an enchantment, an artifact, um, I think that's it, land, and a planeswalker. So you can get all of those permanent types every turn. Say I play Teferi, they kill Teferi, I can play Teferi again the next turn. Um, as long as Muldratha stayed on the battlefield, there was no end to the things that I just kept throwing at my opponents. So that was our plan. My, uh, teammate would beat them down, I would control the board, keep them back until we could get Muldratha out and just get so much value out of our cards that they couldn't keep up. And then we have our lands here. So I only played, let's see here, one, two, six force. Six islands. I'm pretty sure I just cut it even. And then five swamps. So really we only had the right and Josu as far as our black sources went. Um, we really wanted the green so we could get on board quick. And then the blue so that we could manage everything as well. We needed those equal. Now the black was mostly our late game strategy. So we could wait a couple turns to get it out. We didn't need as many copies of the swamps out, and we had the amulet to fix our mana if we needed it sooner than that or didn't see it. And um, we saw the mana, even though we had the amulet only once, we saw it pretty frequently. So that was our two-headed giant game. Like I said, we ended up going uh, one loss, then we won two times in a row, and then we lost two more times. It was pretty unfortunate. We still had a lot of fun. Um, Ended up walking out with a lot of really good cards. We got Muldratha. He's got a lot of value. And other than that, uh, that completes the video. I just want to thank you guys for watching again. If you please like and subscribe, I'll be bringing out more content. We did open a second box, so that'll be the next video that's coming up. And um, I hope you enjoy it.